Good morning, everybody. Welcome to week seven Anthropocene series talk. Uh, I want to say a few words about uh, process here. Um, our speaker will speak for about an hour. Um, there's going to be some time during his talk for you to talk with people next to you about uh, um, these ideas that he's talking about. Uh, and then there'll be time for a question and answer at the end. We have microphones set up in both spaces. So if you have a question, please come over to the microphone to ask your question. This is so that people in the uh, experimental theater can see the questioner and hear the questioner if the questioner happens to be in the recital hall. And so people in the recital hall can see and hear the questioner if they happen to be uh, in the experimental theater. Um, there's a two-way video and audio uh, feed between the spaces, and so with your cooperation, we can make that work and, and feel like one community, even if we're split between two spaces. Also, uh, I'd ask you uh, to not get up and move around during the talk unless it's an emergency, especially in the experimental theater. Uh, moving across the risers makes a lot of noise and is quite distracting and makes it hard for people to listen to what's going on. Okay, so I'm really happy to introduce Zoltan Grossman to you. Uh, Dr. Grossman is a professor of geography and Native American and World Indigenous People Studies at Evergreen. He was co-editor with Alan Parker of the anthology Asserting Native Resilience, Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Face the Climate Crisis. He has been a senior research associate at Evergreen's Northwest Indian Applied Research Institute and its Climate Change and Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Project. Dr. Grossman was co-chair of the Indigenous Peoples special Specialty Group of the American Association of Geographers in 2008-2010, a recipient of the 2014 AAG Enhancing Diversity Award, and an International Geographical Union Observer at the 2008 Climate Change Session of the United States Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. He earned his PhD in geography with a graduate minor in American Indian Studies in 2002 as a Udall Fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and taught at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire in 2002 to 05. His doctoral dissertation, Unlikely Alliances, Treaty Conflicts, and Environmental Cooperation Between Native American and Rural White Communities will be published by the University of Washington Press in 2016. Uh, he was a co-founder of the Midwest Treaty Network during the Wisconsin Ojibwe spearfishing conflict and later helped bring together Native nations with their former adversaries in sport fishing groups to protect the fishery from metallic mining projects. And he's currently teaching with Karen Gall in the program Resource Rebels, Environmental Justice Movements, Building Hope. Zoltan's here today to talk about the resilience doctrine. So welcome, Zoltan. Thank you. Good morning, and thanks, Ruth. Um, I've been teaching now at Evergreen for about a decade, and almost all that time, um, teaching in some way, shape, or form about climate change. And there's nothing more doom and gloom than climate change, teaching about climate change. Today I'm going to be talking about disasters, and uh, there's nothing more literally doom and gloom than disasters, and uh, yet, well, I take a certain approach um, to this work, which I find encapsulated in this cartoon, which I just love. What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? So this is the idea that I think Naomi Klein has been talking about, that climate change can be a catalyst for changes we need to make in our society anyways, and to make those changes on a more accelerated timeline than otherwise they would be, not just because they're a good idea, but because they're necessary for survival. And in our project, um, uh, the Climate Change and Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Project and our, and our book, our anthology, we took the approach of looking at resilience in indigenous communities, um, traditional ecological knowledge, um, political sovereignty, offering the space to grow models of sustainability and cooperation, and the retained sense of community in indigenous uh, societies. And I became, through this project, really fascinated with one aspect, 
because as a non-native, I really look at the native, non-native local relationships between uh, tribes and the neighboring um, white, predominantly white communities um, and tribal and local governments that are always at, at odds with each other, always at loggerheads over jurisdiction, over water rights, over treaty rights. And found something really interesting, particularly at Swinomish up north, um, which is that disaster planning, disaster management, post-disaster recovery, uh, is one way that tribal and local governments are cooperating with each other. It's one way to build a bridge because when you're cut off from the rest of the state because of a landslide or a flood, you only have each other to rely on. And we've had a number of these uh, disasters developing uh, with increased frequency in the Pacific Northwest. And um, uh, I particularly remember the December 2006 windstorm. Uh, we were without power, I think, without about six days, our neighborhood on the west side here. And um, the winds also have been shifting in such a way north-south to not be depositing until this year, really, depositing enough snow in the mountains for there to be adequate runoff in some years, which is bad for the salmon streams. Um, and of course, all this, there has to be a disclaimer, always at the beginning of any climate change um, lecture, that weather patterns, particular weather patterns, don't indicate you can't tie a particular storm or a particular event to climate change because it's, it's patterns over time. Um, so that's the disclaimer. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I think the real disclaimer should be if you haven't noticed that there's really freaky weather going on with increased frequency and increased intensity and uh, the highest temperatures known in human history, um, then you're not fit for public office. That's the disclaimer we should be saying. So there's been this whole series up by Skokomish uh, recurring landslides on the highway, which uh, really did for a while cut off Skokomish Hoods Port from the rest of the state. Uh, the flooding uh, in this area, the um, mudslide down the Kennedy Creek that destroyed Ranch House Barbecue for a little while, which was a real blow um, around here for a while. Um, the busiest intersection, the city down at Black Lake and Cooper Point looked like this during one of the the floods. So um, this kind of focuses the thinking on the possibilities of real disruption, economic disruption. The um, December 07 flooding in Lewis County around Centralia and Chehalis literally cut off Seattle from Portland for about two weeks. You couldn't get there on I-5. Amtrak was shut down. And these two major metropolitan areas and the major corridor, the major economic hub on the West Coast was severed um, by an event which maybe combined uh, the intensity of climate change with some really poor land use planning in, in uh, Lewis County. Um, a lot of erosion happening there, a lot of big box stores, um, a lot of concrete. And, um, but I think that looking at these kinds of events um, also uh, got me thinking. Then we had a whole series of, there was the blizzard, there was the flooding, um, uh, there was the ice storm uh, that really toppled quite a few of the trees here on campus. And I went over, uh, my wife and I went over to a fellow professor's house and we were there for a couple of days because the power was out and they had a fireplace and uh, a lot of games, little liquor, um, so it was actually kind of a good time, but it was really dangerous to walk around the west side. The limbs were coming down off the trees. The ice was caking uh, the trees. And of course, because there had been a lot of moisture loosening the roots of a lot of the trees, whenever they were weighted down, um, they would come down on the power lines, uh, just like in the windstorm. And so that's how the power gets knocked out in particular uh, in this area. And of course, we've had the really massive disasters, the landslides that have closed off Amtrak and parts of the interstate system and uh, punctuated by the horrible tragedy in Oso in uh, 2014 in the massive landslide that killed 43 people. And again, that was a very intense period of spring rain um, that was kind of unprecedented, but this one was exacerbated by poor logging practices that had clear cut an area right at the top and uh, staff of two of the local tribes had warned um, the state uh, that this was going to create a problem. This was already an unstable slope. It was made worse uh, by those poor logging practices. And um, 
uh, 43 people lost their lives that morning. Um, so we're going to be seeing uh, recurring incidents like this. And I also found it interesting at the time that the tribes offered um, funding to the local non-native communities, shelter uh, for some of them who couldn't find shelter. And so this kind of mutual aid that happened after the disaster as well was something I was really, really curious about. And of course, we've had the whole series, and particularly in central and eastern Wisconsin, uh, Washington, of uh, wildfires. Um, the Carlton Complex fire was the largest in recorded state history, 200 homes burned in the Methow Valley. The Wenatchee blaze I saw, not at the time, but shortly afterwards, the damage from that. And um, this um, increased intensity and scope of the wildfires uh, simultaneous in different parts of the country uh, that really puts a tax on the capacity of the firefighting community. And this last year, the unprecedented um, uh, problem of having fires, wildfires in the rainforest um, on the coast, something that hasn't happened in uh, recorded history to this degree. There was one small one near uh, Quinault, um, a much larger uh, series of fires on the western uh, side of Vancouver Island, one of the deepest uh, rainforests, uh, temperate rainforests in the world, uh, filling uh, much of the country with smoke. And um, so this is something very disturbing. Our class resource rebels, part of it is working with the Quinault Nation on economic alternatives to oil terminals in Grays Harbor. And we're going, we're hearing about the threat now of wildfires on top of the threat of tsunamis, on top of the threat of oil. Um, and maybe they're all kind of related to uh, some of the same uh, origins in our climate crisis. And of course, we also have the situation of massive drought in California in the Southwest, which can also affect our local economy uh, through refugees coming in. And we've noticed, um, uh, and I, if you look on a map, and this is one of the few areas in the entire country where the aquifer is recharged by rainwater, not just from glacial or snowpack runoff, but also from rainwater. So we're sitting pretty in terms of relative to the rest of the country, even though we've had drought problems in Western Washington, uh, we're definitely relative to the rest of the country and a very attractive place to go. And so you're gonna start seeing more people coming up from places like Arizona. And if you notice when you go out to the coast, the new Seabrook housing development, pretty expensive homes, uh, but you're seeing more of these kinds of things sprouting up, which of course, course puts more pressure on our own ecosystem when you have this influx of people. So we're affected in this region in all sorts of different ways, all sorts of different paths. So just wanted to take a step back, kind of look at these concepts of emergency, of disaster, of catastrophe. And one way to, to think about them sometimes is to look at uh, uh, the, the origins of words. So emergency, I found this really interesting. Um, coming from Latin, e, opposite, and mergere, or submerge in liquid. So turning something into its opposite by submerging it in liquid. And I think Hurricane Sandy, some of the images of the New York subway system being inundated, um, and some of these uh, iconic streets that we would never think would be touched in the center of our economic empire, um, uh, and really New York being uh, put to a halt by Hurricane Sandy. Catastrophe, kata in Greek, down, stripen, turning over, turning over, down. So this is uh, Hurricane Sandy's uh, effect on an amusement park in New Jersey. That was the old roller coaster. Um, this is an area, I think, by Red Hook in Brooklyn that was pretty much wiped out, an area uh, that actually I think also had some toxic wastes. And so you can see in a very short period of time the idea of an entire society Again, the center of the empire, in a sense, being turned over, being turned down. And disaster, which I think is a really interesting, and I had not understood this origin, dis without astro star, without a star, without a guiding light, without um, the ability to navigate, in a sense. And uh, it's really interesting in the context of some of these disasters when there's a blackout and there are a lot of stars for the first time being seen in a metropolitan area. And I think some of the haunting images, again, from Hurricane Sandy, where you have 
the amusement park, the merry-go-round in the middle of the, the storm surge area uh, on the coast of New Jersey. So I wanted to maybe pause for, for a few minutes and have people maybe share with each other um, if you have any personal stories or family stories of either being involved in a disaster yourself or family members or friends uh, being involved in some kind of disaster that in a sense, not something like a car accident, but something that's a massive community uh, changing event. Uh, and if you haven't been involved yourself or know somebody, if you've heard about particular disasters and what you in particular saw the effect of people uh, what people did afterwards, um, how people responded to each other, how people either came together or didn't come together in that kind of uh, context. And maybe during the question period, uh, maybe if you've got some really good stories, you can share them at that time and kind of draw some lessons from that. So really want people to get together and talk, um, just as people do in a disaster. Uh, your phones actually don't really work here. Um, there's really bad reception. So don't get on your, on your phone, actually talk with each other. And uh, that also replicates what people do in these uh, situations of catastrophe. So I'll give you a, give you a few minutes. I'm hearing some really awesome stories, so uh, we'll have a chance maybe to, to share a few uh, in the question period. So one of the ways that uh, I began to think about disaster was through uh, Naomi Klein's classic, uh, The Shock Doctrine. And if you're not familiar with the book, as everyone should be really in the society, um, she analyzed recent events in the world, both within the United States and outside the United States, um, through the prism of three shocks. That either, uh, it started with a shock of either a natural or human-made disaster. Uh, could be a hurricane, could be a war. Um, and there's a second shock of uh, privatization. Corporate interests move in to privatize the economy and institute the shock of austerity, using the original disaster as a rationale or excuse or mask in order to do so. And that those who resist this austerity uh, or resist the original disaster, such as an invasion, um, that they would be literally shocked um, uh, through torture. And uh, so she documented how these three different systems of shock work together and reinforce each other, that disasters increasingly provide windows into a cruel and ruthlessly divided future in which money and race buy survival. And there's really no better illustration in US history than uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And she calls it disaster capitalism taking advantage of a major disaster to adopt economic austerity policies that a distracted and desperate population would be less likely to accept under normal circumstances. This isn't just the Bush administration in 2005, but um, Yeltsin in Russia, even left-leaning governments in places like Peru. With resource scarcity and climate change, providing a steadily increasing flow of new disasters, responding to emergencies is simply too hot an emerging market to be left to the nonprofits. And so again, Katrina, uh, what happened after Katrina of the repression, that third shock, literally of Blackwater mercenaries being brought in from one region of the shock doctrine, Iraq, into New Orleans uh, to repress the population. White vigilantes um, and police uh, going after people who are simply trying to survive, simply trying to leave the city for safety. Um, and uh, a number of murders taking place. But oh, really overlooked in her book, and in only one small section of her book, does Klein look at the flip side, which she at the time called people's renewal. And that is the response from the grassroots, the bottom-up response uh, in a post-disaster kind of situation. The best way to recover from helplessness turns out to be helping having the right to be part of a communal recovery. Such people's reconstruction efforts represent the antithesis of the disaster capitalism complex's ethos. These are movements that do not seek to start from scratch, but rather from scrap, from the rubble that is all around. And she looked at uh, the Common Ground Collective after uh, Hurricane Katrina, and there's been many other instances since then that I'll get into in a bit.
So I call this disaster cooperativism. Could call it disaster socialism, but I think in the US at least, socialism has the connotation of being from the state. And the point is that in these situations, the state is failing or the state is being set up to fail by the massive budget cuts, the downsizing of the state that we've seen in recent decades in the ne neoliberal period. Responding to a major disaster with cooperative, community-based ways to ensure immediate survival and engaging people in exploring social and environmental solutions that they would be less likely to accept under normal apathetic circumstances. And I'm talking here about even politically conservative people that may act in a radical way in these trying times. Rooted in the communities where they live, these men and women see themselves as mere repair people, fixing it, making it better and more equal. Most of all, they are building in resilience for when the next shock hits. So I actually asked uh, Naomi Klein about this when she uh, spoke at Seattle Town Hall, and she came up with a lot more examples of this kind of disaster cooperativism that she saw as uh, a possible way forward in constructing a new society, that because we're seeing more and more disasters uh, coming in the future, we're going to be seeing uh, more opportunities, in a sense, uh, to redirect the conversation and, and people's action. During good times, it's easy to deride big government, she says in her new book, This Changes Everything, and talk about the inevitability of cutbacks. But during disasters, most everyone loses their free market religion and wants to know that their government has their backs. And if there's one thing we can be sure of, it's that extreme weather events like Superstorm Sandy, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, and the British floods, disasters that combined pummeled coastlines beyond recognition, ravaged millions of homes and killed many thousands, are going to keep coming. Over the course of the 1970s, there were 660 reported disasters around the world, including droughts, floods, extreme temperature events, wildfires, and storms. In the 2000s, there were 3,322, a five-fold boost. That is a staggering increase in just over 30 years, and clearly global warming cannot be said to have caused all of it, but the climate signal is also clear. And uh, one of our students in Resource Rebels actually has been going around the country photographing um, areas of disasters or areas of energy development um, where the train exploded, uh, oil train exploded in Quebec, for instance. And she visited Greensburg, Kansas, which is a fascinating case study where when people were in the shelters in this kind of conservative um, uh, wheat belt town, um, and they were actually experiencing the tornado, they were already talking about recovery. They were already talking about bringing in sustainability into their reconstruction plan. They were already talking about something they instituted, which was nonpartisan elections to take uh, party politics out of the uh, planning process. And they've uh, developed a really innovative, um, renewable energy intensive uh, plan for recovery. And so you see interesting models of this, this kind of process happening in some of the most unlikely places you would think to find them. You might think to find something like that in Olympia, um, but this is in Kansas. And uh, it shows how disasters can suddenly switch um, uh, uh, political realities and social realities. Um, you can see that in other instances in world history, um, how the earthquake in Managua in 1972, uh, which is often, that really the only time we heard about that was because Howard Hughes happened to be there in a hotel. Um, but it was a, a real devastation to the capital city of Nicaragua. And because the relief funds and relief supplies that came in were diverted by the Somoza dictatorship, it really turned people even more against their dictator, turned them towards the Sandinista rebels, who by 1979 had won their revolution, their left uh, leaning revolution. Whether or not the earthquake helped that along, if it would have happened without the earthquake, uh, you know, history would tell. But uh, it, they saw it definitely as a contributing factor. The collapse of the Soviet Union, um, perhaps hastened along by the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, which not only exposed the state secrecy of the Soviet system because uh, they tried to keep a lid on the information coming out, really 
the rest of the world only found out about the uh, radioactive leak when sensors at a nuclear plant, I believe in Sweden, started going off when the, when the workers went to work in the morning. Um, but also um, some ethnic minorities from places like uh, Lithuania were brought in to uh, help with the cleanup. They were in a sense drafted. Uh, to help with the cleanup, which really increased that nationalist resentment of some of the Soviet republics, turned them more against the center, more against Moscow, and the Soviet Union collapsed by 1991. Again, might have happened anyway, but perhaps on a slightly different timetable had it not been for Chernobyl. Um, we also have social economic disasters um, in uh, South America, the collapse of economies in Chile during the military dictatorship, um, people having to feed themselves in communal kitchens uh, when there wasn't uh, enough to eat in the olla común or the collective cooking pot. Um, and that was often done by protesters against the military regime. Same with the workers' cooperatives that led the popular rebellion and took over factories in Argentina during their economic crisis in the early 2000s. And that involved meeting people's basic needs. And for the um, opposition movement, for the rebels in a sense to be a part of that, uh, gave them, offered them legitimacy. Um, and took away legitimacy from the government that wasn't meeting people's needs. Saw the same thing after the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, where uh, Shia organizations became really um, um, expert, the Hausa, the seminaries in southern Iraq, um, uh, the Shia parties in southern Lebanon uh, that took it upon themselves to um, you know, feed the people, to organize basic social services, to get the electricity turned back on. Um, aside from political propaganda, uh, this gave them legitimacy and took legitimacy away from the occupations, the military occupations, and the uh, politicians that collaborated with them. And uh, in both places, they overwhelmingly won elections um, pretty soon after the disaster of these invasions. Um, I had a project with one of my classes in Wisconsin looking at the Indian Ocean tsunami that struck Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, India uh, uh, in December of 2004. And the quake and the tsunami devastated uh, vast areas of northern Sumatra or Aceh province uh, in Indonesia, um, uh, Tamil regions of Sri Lanka, both of which were going through insurgencies at the time, and they changed the political equation, the quake and tsunami changed the political equations in really interesting ways in that um, it hastened peace talks between the Aceh rebels who had stepped in as a force to try and uh, 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 recover uh, the, the economy, uh, actually in cooperation with some of the local governments. And soon after, there were peace talks and a peace deal that ended that insurgency. Uh, that didn't exactly happen with the Tamil insurgency in Sri Lanka. That continued and, and was repressed by the Sri Lanka military. So it's not always the case that there are these kinds of outcomes. But we always think of disaster as something that is only going to bring about negative outcomes. And I think that there are some really creative politically thinking people um, in these examples that I've shown you who have turned uh, 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 the, the compass towards justice um, at, in a, this post-disaster atmosphere. Um, and of course, we had the triple whammy in Japan in 2011. Uh, first, uh, the earthquake, which Japanese uh, citizens have experienced quite often. Uh, Elaine Scarry talks about the the mutual aid societies in Kobe, um, and Kobe is a sister uh, university to uh, Evergreen, um, after their 1995 earthquake and how uh, in Kobe they were able to recover. Unfortunately, in northern Honshu, uh, the earthquake was followed by the massive tsunami, uh, which wiped out a lot of the coastal towns and industry. Um, and we all saw that on, on television and uh, the aftermath being uh, literally the complete devastation of some of these cities. And then of course, followed by the third whammy, the uh, nuclear meltdown at Fukushima. 
And these are some amazing photographs by a Polish photographer who went in and saw the um, massive um, uh, landfills of garbage bags full of contaminated radioactive soil in this immediate area around the plant, which is in the background. Um, and also some of the uh, kind of post-apocalyptic uh, scenes that we've also seen in the Chernobyl evacuation zone of cars that were abandoned, computers that were abandoned with, um, with um, green uh, plants growing around them, and uh, how, in a sense, uh, time stood still uh, in Fukushima. And this is an area, uh, evacuation area, that's gotten smaller and smaller, uh, but nevertheless uh, is a no-go area to this day. And Fukush the aftermath of Fukushima was kind of interesting because there was a Japanese society mobilized to do the physical cleanup uh, in a very efficient way. Um, in the tsunami zone, uh, but when it came to the radioactive zone, there's really nothing that can be done, and so the response of the people was to reinvigorate their anti-nuclear movement, which, of course, is the, the location where Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened, has always been there, and there's always been a strong movement against nuclear power, but because Japan uh, otherwise would be reliant on Persian Gulf oil, there's always been a strong pro-nuclear lobby in Japan. And for a couple of years there, for a few years, there was uh, a freeze on nuclear power. The nuclear reactors were shut down and there was a real uh, movement to convert to renewable energies. Uh, but the Jap new Japanese government has restarted some of those reactors. But the response of the people, the massive response of the people, has been quite interesting. Now, one of the, uh, of quite s during the same period of Japan, there was a series of three earthquakes. The third one was the worst um, in New Zealand. And I had a class um, at the time in New Zealand, uh, native decolonization in the Pacific Rim. We worked with uh, Maori and Pacific Islander communities in New Zealand. And uh, we uh, actually had a student there in Christchurch on South Island. Most of us were on North Island where most Maori are. Uh, working with Maori communities, but he was in Christchurch, and actually, he, um, he, I had told the class not to go to Christchurch because it was geologically unstable. There had been previous earthquakes there. I said, don't go there, but he was absent that day, so I forever have a story now that if you miss even one of my classes, you might die, <laughs> but um, luckily, he was an EMT from Wyoming trained in search and rescue, and this evergreen student actually pulled people out of the rubble. Um, and, but it was the longest 16 minutes I had ever spent from the notification on the radio of the earthquake from hearing that he was okay. Um, but downtown Christchurch is still a wreck. Um, there's still rubble. Um, there's a red zone in the central business district that uh, is still being reconstructed. And I found a little while ago a really amazing video um, just a three minute video that I wanted to play for you um, called Living Like Kings about the uh, situation of the homeless uh, community in Christchurch, many of whom are indigenous Maori themselves. And um, this is their story of what Christchurch, what the earthquake meant to them. To us, it was the best thing that could ever happen. I could handle the uh, earthquake every day, personally. Regardless of the shaking and the trauma, it made our world a lot different than what it was. We felt like the poor have come rich overnight. I'm cowboy. I live out on the street. I've been out of a house for about three years, roughly. The rest of the time I've been in jail for just getting shelter. Two thousand and seven. This is how I used to live. I used to sleep over there. You'll see from this to what we've got now, and we only get. Yeah. It's Altran. 
Our living arrangements are actually a lot better than what they used to be. The homeless, we were living like kings. We were staying in abandoned buildings. Some of these places, there's hardly anything wrong with them. They are flash houses. They've got lounge suites, they've got champagne on the tables where they've left them. Excuse me, so we'll sort this one I've got here. Beds, real bossy beds. You know, I haven't been on a bed for a long time. It's like Christmas to us. Yeah, huh? There's a big ass 13 story building. It was abandoned, and so all the homeless and the street people ended up sleeping in the luxury hotel. We were leaning out the window and saying, Hey, Rose! And then heaps of people laughing at us because, you know, we're staying in a luxury hotel. The ground rumbled. It's a different set of rules. I could go to pubs where I'm not allowed. I could wear bare feet in pubs. I take my animals wherever I like. Fuck, it's great. We've never seen anything like this in our lives. <laughs> we love it, man. We really love it, eh? And we think, oh, fuck, we've got a taste of it. Now, what the rich are doing. I think they take the comfort for granted. I don't think they really realise what they've got. Yeah, yeah, we're living like kings. We, we're starting to get the taste of your will. So, yeah, um, we're starting to get a taste of your world. Uh, just thought that that was a really interesting take because, again, disasters are really negative, horrible things that the most vulnerable populations are the ones who suffer the most. We can see in places like Haiti, whether it's a hurricane or an earthquake, um, it's the poor that pay, pay the most. But uh, it can also upend the social order in very interesting ways. and. I think the person who has grasped this um, the most, well, let me first kind of talk about our own, our own region because we face the possibility of a big one. Uh, Olympia did have um, an earthquake in 2001. It caused damage downtown. I think this is at maybe uh, Columbia and Fifth, uh, that old bank building. There was some damage on campus. And of course, uh, we have the Cascadia subduction zone, the crust um, uh, being subducted off our coast and a uh, massive earthquake and tsunami struck the region in 1700 and uh, we're kind of due for a new one. Uh, they found um, soil samples, sand samples, um, uh, layers out by the coast uh, uh, and actually a ghost forest that had been submerged by salt water at that time and you can still see the, the snags, the, the, the trees uh, from that. And uh, they correlated that to the a tsunami that struck Japan that's on the historic records and also combined that with indigenous oral traditions from this region that talk about a massive earthquake, tsunami, and landslides that took place. And so, um, you know, earthquakes don't necessarily have a direct uh, tied to climate change, but they are a disaster we should be looking at when looking at future disasters of climate change. And of course, that it, there is that theory by the British, I think, geophysicist Bill McGuire that, who talks about the possibility, and I don't want to testify to it because I'm not a geologist myself, but the possibility that thermal expansion of the oceans, sea level rise um, can put pressure, localized pressure on faults and um, that the uh, recession of ice sheets can also cause a rebounding of crust. And so you could have potentially um, localized effects on, on fault systems. I don't know about that. Don't ask me about that because I don't know about it. Um, but there is that possibility that there is perhaps some kind of tie between climate change and, um, and tectonic action or volcanic action. But the person who has really looked at the social effects of disasters, I think is Rebecca Solnit. And I really recommend this book, A Paradise Built in Hell. 
the ability of disasters to topple old orders and open up new possibilities. Extraordinary communities that arise in disaster. In many disasters, she writes, strangers become friends and collaborators. Goods are shared freely. People improvise new roles for themselves. Imagine a society where money plays little or no role, where people rescue each other and then care for each other, where food is given away, where the old divides between people seem to have fallen away. So part of this was studying um, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake in her city of San Francisco uh, on the centennial, and part of it was her experience of the 1989 uh, San Francisco earthquake and how mutual aid uh, occurred and how some of these uh, divisions, at least temporarily, um, fell away. And she looked at other disasters. Um, Solnit in particular looked at a hurricane in 2003 in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Everybody woke up the next morning and everything was different. There was no electricity, all the stores were closed, no one had access to media. The consequence was that everyone poured out into the street to bear witness. Not quite a street party, but everyone out at once. It was a sense of happiness to see everybody, even though we didn't know each other. That was a man who experienced the post-hurricane recovery in Halifax. And of course, we have experience of social disasters being alleviated because disaster isn't just an event. A disaster can be a recurring phenomenon in everyday life of particular communities in the US. The history of disaster demonstrates that most of us are social animals, hungry for connection, as well as for purpose and meaning. It also suggests that if this is who we are, then everyday life in most places is a disaster that disruptions sometimes give us a, a chance to change. So I think when we're looking back, for instance, at the tumult of the 1960s, at the Black Panther Party, I think a lot of the propaganda about the Black Panther Party, at least until uh, Beyonce showed a positive image at the Super Bowl uh, recently, um, was of this militant uh, armed um, uh, activist organization. And it was really kind of forgotten in the popular memory um, outside the African American community that the Black Panthers had a free breakfast program for kids. We're actually trying um, in the situation of um, uh, the neighborhoods being neglected uh, to provide those basic services to the people as part of their activism. We see that in uh, homeless encampments like Camp Quixote in, uh, in Olympia of um, people's activism being uh, practical in a sense, not just ideological, not just about protest or opposing the system, but actually trying to build something sustainable in its place. So this is the image that I think popular culture has for how human beings interact, <laughs> is Survivor, right? Um, the reality TV show of people being stranded on a desert island and being in harsh competition with each other and insulting each other and voting each other off the island. And, um, you know, the kind of the Lord of the Flies idea that uh, with a shortage that they're going to be uh, in conflict with each other and might even uh, harm each other. But if you're really stranded on a desert island with other people, is this really what your experience would be? Is this kind of harsh, neoliberal, kind of individualistic, everyone for themselves kind of situation? I actually think not. I think if you were actually stranded on a desert island, it would be a little bit more like this. Um, and I remember, like, every time, you know, coming home from school, it was I Dream of Genie, Hogan's Heroes, and, and Gilligan's Island. And uh, this was the Keynesian period in political economy, right? People were cooperating. And if you remember the characters, or if you've seen it on Nick at Night, you know, you didn't see it at the time, uh, but it's been in reruns you know that kind of, in a sense, the social order was upended. That, uh, what was the millionaire's name? Thurston Howell III and his wife, who would have been the elite in the outside society, were completely useless on Gilligan's Island, right? And Ginger, the movie star, she was always in the way. And uh, the skipper, who would be the major authority, the political authority, the one in charge, he was a total doofus. So. Um, they were completely useless. And the ones who had the practical knowledge, the professor, of course, um, Marianne, the farm girl from Kansas, um, had practical knowledge on how to get out of 
kind of these uh, tough situations. And um, in particular, Gilligan, the lowest ranking person there, who was kind of a bumbling idiot, but he always kind of saved the day. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, I think, a better model <laughs> of how people would really function uh, uh, stranded on a desert island in trying circumstances um, is uh, not the uh, capitalist neoliberal model you see in Survivor, but more of the idea of lending each other a helping hand in a practical sense. But popular culture these days, any kind of post-disaster situation is definitely Mad Max, right? It's, uh, you know, gang members out there that are going to um, pillage and, and destroy everything and uh, that if there's any uh, shift in the social order and if the status quo is ended, this is the possibility that we have for the future. Be afraid of it, have fear of that kind of change, of that of disaster upend, upending or rebellion or revolution upending the social order because this is what's gonna result. And that has fed into an ideology, a very strong ne neoliberal ideology of how to respond to uh, disasters. I think Elaine Scarry uh, really identified this. One of the things that has seduced people into giving up their own actions is the claim of emergency. The government will often make the spurious claim that because certain things require very fast action, there is no time for ordinary processes of deliberation and thinking. I find exactly the opposite to be the case. Thinking and emergency action are deeply compatible. Sometimes that thinking takes the form of very recognizable deliberative processes and many other times we build all the deliberation into protocols. But the idea that we're supp supposed to suspend our thinking was very much illustrated by Katrina. Um, and the fact is that Solnit documents is that sociologists have documented that ordinary people are usually calm and rarely panic in emergencies, but elites perceive a threat from out of control and unruly Mad Max style mobs. And so create a myth of social panic that shapes their actions and they panic as a result. What she calls elite panic reinforces an assumption that human nature is greedy and animalistic and an upending of their social order can only lead to chaos. So Solnit says hierarchies and institutions are inadequate to these circumstances. They are often what fails in such crises. Civil society is what succeeds, not only in an emotional demonstration of altruism and mutual aid, but also in a practical mustering of creativity and resources to meet the challenges. So we had a whole series of myths during the Katrina crisis that gang members were murdering people in the Superdome. But in fact, Solnit documents um, and quotes uh, Denise Moore, um, who was there. They were, the gang members were the ones getting juice for the babies. They were the ones getting clothes for the people who had walked through that water. They were the ones fanning the old people because that's what moved the gangster guys the most, the plight of the old people, not what we heard on CNN or MSNBC or Fox. And of course, after Katrina, you had common ground, building clinics, mobile medics, soup kitchens, tool lending stations, uh, distributing good that, goods that had been left in the warehouses of the Red Cross. People on both sides of the old racial divides went away with changed perceptions. The volunteers mitigated the racial violence and demonization of the first days after the storm, which of course were filled with white vigilante and police violence. And I think some of this is pretty well illustrated in if you've seen the HBO series Treme, which looks at um, the uh, uh, Lower Ninth Ward uh, after Katrina. Disasters, Solnit says, are most basically terrible, tragic, grievous, and no matter what positive side effects and possibilities they produce, they are not to be desired. But by the same measure, those side effects should not be ignored because they arise amid devastation. Most social change is chosen. You want to belong to a co-op. You believe in social safety nets or community-supported agriculture. But disaster doesn't sort us out by preferences. It drags us into emergencies that require we act and act altruistically, bravely, and with initiative in order to survive or save the neighbors. 
One reason that disasters are threatening to elites is that power devolves to the people on the ground in many ways. It is the neighbors who are the first responders and who assemble the impromptu kitchens and networks to rebuild. And it demonstrates the viability of a dispersed, decentralized system of decision making. Citizens themselves in these moments constitute the government, the acting decision making body, as democracy is always promised and rarely delivered. Thus disasters often unfold as though a revolution has already taken place. And um, I think this plays out also in terms of women's leadership in post-disaster situations. This is a, a Homa indigenous uh, woman from Louisiana who said FEMA and the Red Cross were incompetent and ineffective. I don't know where we would be without the volunteers. Our people have language barriers and education barriers. 47% of the adult population in her area has less than a high school education. And all over the world, as Deborah McNutt mentions in our book, uh, uh, quoting the Intergovernmental Pl Panel on Climate Change, because women are particularly vulnerable in disaster situations around the world and risk a lot for the, the children when they have the primary uh, uh, child-caring responsibilities in many societies, women make an important contribution to disaster reduction, often informally through participating in disaster management and acting as agents of social change. Their resilience and their networks are critical in household and community recovery. So we can really see a lot of this at, at play in Hurricane Sandy, which like Katrina affected some of the most low-lying and poorest neighborhoods in uh, Brooklyn, Queens, um, and parts of Staten Island. Um, and we, of course, heard about the official relief operations. Uh, but Occupy Sandy was an outgrowth of the Occupy movement from the previous year and used some of the skills of mutual aid that came up during that time. This is a photo that was posted. We have power. Please feel free to charge your phones, giving away um, services, trying to give away food, um, and organizing people in a way that the state, in particular FEMA and the Red Cross and the National Guard, was not doing at the time. And having it be a sustained campaign of recovery for these communities, not just back to the status quo, but in neighborhoods like Red Hook to really empower, in a sense, the communities to take on some of this in a sustained way. So uh, it got to the point where Occupy Sandy was actually feeding the FEMA workers and the National Guard who weren't being fed by their own organizations um, and were quite disorganized. They turned to the activist community, which because of the experience in Occupy, were better organized um, than the state. And some really ingenious things came out of, the, uh, out of this. The wedding registry was one of my favorites, where they had an online wedding registry uh, in all these different businesses where you could, it's not just a matter of giving money, but you could give money for a particular, here's for a refrigerator, uh, for instance. Um, so people even outside the geographic area could help in ways. So um, uh, one of the ideas, though, that Solnit really doesn't explore enough is how to sustain this kind of activity beyond the two or three weeks after disaster instead of it going back to the status quo. And Occupy Sandy is really organizing some of these neighborhoods and, um, and involving them in ways to spend uh, some of these funds and how to rebuild some of the businesses as worker-owned cooperatives. So um, there's some really interesting things still happening and uh, interesting conferences, trainings, um, that sort of thing happening. So in in conclusion, I wanted to kind of look at some of the common denominators that I'm seeing before, during, and after a disaster, and that Solnit is, is highlighting. And one is, um, a lot of students come to me saying, you know, I want a green job, I want to work in building wind turbines or solar panels. I say, well, there isn't that much, unfortunately, uh, government uh, funding for that, and private industry is only starting to get into it. So if you want a green job, start thinking about community planning, start thinking about emergency response and recovery, get jobs in the Red Cross, in FEMA, in the THS, in these agencies that are dealing with these, partly to deny them to people who would use those jobs in order to impose um, the will of um, capitalist society on these communities, uh, also to blow the whistle uh, on these agencies when they're not doing their mission. Um, be prepared, be prepared for the inevitable crisis, whether it's an earthquake or a storm, 
uh, not just wait for or respond to it where people are thinking in the emergency, not to exploit the disasters for our purposes, but to be on alert that others will exploit it and, uh, and to be prepared for that. Um, to not leave a vacuum in that planning process and to propose alternate disaster planning around the public sector, economic cooperation, and environmental sustainability. Um, this is a book, Collaborative Resilience. If we're going to create climate-resistant communities, integrating social dimensions into climate change planning must be the rule rather than, than the exception. Social strategies for localized resilience need to become a social movement. And we see that out on the coast where the tribes uh, Ho and Quileute, Ho had to sandbag his tribal headquarters because of uh, massive flooding. Quileute has had to move its school, starting to move its school to higher ground because of storm surges sending giant logs into the area. Um, and so you see those two tribes as well as Quinault, um, which is very vulnerable to tsunamis, which are going to get even worse with sea level rise, uh, moving a lot of its housing from the lower village up to higher ground. And our class actually visited um, the main planner uh, for that process. There are a lot of different uh, websites, national, international organizations that are dealing with that local social adaptation to the inevitable effects of, of the climate crisis that we know are already in the pipe. We know they're already happening. P resilience is one's uh, ICLEI, local governments for sustainability. Um, we see examples of cooperation between tribes and local governments. Olympia, together with Nisqually, has moved the source of our fresh drinking water to higher ground. Uh, away from McAllister Springs up to a well field. Um, you have Swinomish cooperating with some of the local governments that have been battling over water rights, but planning together for um, responding to uh, floods that have been recurring in that low-lying area. Uh, Umatilla sharing fire trucks, emergency equipment with other communities. Our class was actually at La Push when there was an evacuation drill for a tsunami and uh, saw how efficiently um, the Quileute uh, tribe did that. And uh, I remember in 2005, there was an actual tsunami warning, and um, the tribes evacuated their people to higher ground. The non-native communities weren't as well prepared, and so those communities were saying, why can't our local governments do it like the tribes? And so this is the kind of models that are being created for responses. And of course, our downtown is very vulnerable to flooding. There's just been uh, uh, articles about it recently in the paper. This is the projected um, flood area for moderate sea level rise that the city of Olympia itself came out with. So a few years ago, we had a blue line march um, that I helped to organize where we um, dressed with flippers and, and goggles and um, uh, that sort of thing in order to kind of beach balls. We had a brass band and we marched along the um, uh, projected beach of future Olympia and marked it with chalk and uh, kind of did in a festive way because you don't want to be all doom and gloom about climate change but to educate the community that this is serious threat to Olympia. The Transition Towns Network has done quite a bit um, in planning for uh, climate change on the local level. Now there are websites that um, local neighborhoods like next door uh, enables people to do things like you know, uh, catching missing dogs or chickens, but they can help build a web of local resilience in neighborhoods. So during a disaster, that's preparing for disaster, but during a disaster, kind of forgetting about assumptions. You can't rely on the internet in that case, or on electricity, or on water supply. Um, neighbors have to be sharing generators, um, uh, barbecuing what's going to go bad in their freezer, um, using solar power or bicycle power for electricity, and planning ahead and even getting out information, you can't use a copy machine, and you can't rely on the state to get information out. So I think we should begin looking for these old mimeograph hand-cranked machines um, to get the word out in these kind of situations. So if you see any on eBay, get them. Um, and Solnit, I think, in, in closing, one of the most beautiful parts of, um, of Solnit's book is talking about the blackout in the Northeast in 2003. The loss of electrical power meant that the light pollution blotting out the night sky vanished. The Milky Way could be seen in New York City. 
a heavenly realm long lost to view. You can think of the current social order as something akin to this artificial light, another kind of power that fails in disaster. In its place appears a reversion to improvised, collaborative, cooperative, and local society. The constellations of solidarity, altruism, and improvisation are within most of us and reappear at these times. People know what to do in a disaster. And part of that is cooperativism. This is a barn raising in the Midwest. People are more open to a cooperative mes message in these times after a disaster and individualized competitive models they know aren't working as well or are dependent on very vulnerable corporate supply lines. And they know that they can't rely on FEMA or the feds to rescue us. So networks of local social relationships can help to break down barriers beyond sandbagging a river. And people are also more open to a sustainable message, um, like uh, to critique the uh, strip logging that the clear cutting that contributed to Lewis County flooding. After they've witnessed the actual effects, even conservative people will begin to incorporate some of these ideas to create these networks of community skills and prepare. So the, the problem that, again, Solnit really didn't address is how to make the cooperation last beyond the disaster by institutionalizing it. And I think that some of the community work we see, like Camp Quixote, which uh, Evergreen students played a big role in um, helping along in 2007, and now has resulted in the tiny homes um, that uh, is um, the Quixote Village. So blurring the distinctions between services and activism is, I think, really important. Community organizers with social service experience may be better equipped for the changes ahead than activists who are debating each other. The value of brass tax logistics, of meeting human needs, of shelter, of food, um, survival skills is going to be very important in this kind of activism. So really to contrast the shock doctrine from Klein with what I'm talking about, disaster cooperativism, uh, public ownership instead of private property, community motive instead of profit motive, cooperation instead of competition, the wealthy pay their fair share instead of austerity, sustainable planning inst instead of endless growth, green energy instead of fossil fuels and nuclear. So. Finally, a little plug for a program that I'm teaching with uh, Shangri-La Joshi Wynn, uh, Catastrophe, Community Resilience in the Face of Disaster. We're going to be exploring a lot of these issues in spring next year. So I hope uh, some of you might take the program and um, maybe have some suggestions for what we might pursue. So thank you so much. Well, interesting question.